Okay, well, thank you, Peter. Uh, thanks, uh, everybody, for coming on this Saturday afternoon. Uh, today's paper is going to be about the earliest Christianity at Whithorn, which is almost, incidentally, the earliest Christianity in Scotland that we have evidence for, except for a couple of small finds with Christian imagery from the Silver Horde at Traprain Law, which is in East Lothian, maybe dates to the beginning of the fifth century now in a recent reassessment. Other than that, the earliest evidence for Christianity in what we now call Scotland is indeed from Whithorn in the southwest part of the country in Galloway. And so I've been working quite a bit with the Whithorn Trust over the last several years. Uh, I've been lucky enough to work with them there, and you'll hear all about that. Um, I first got interested in this subject, though, because my PhD research was on early Christian burial practice. And following on from Emma's outstanding paper this morning, I don't really need to say much more about that in particular, other than to say that in Scotland, we don't have the benefit of those furnished burials, burials with lots of grave goods that sort of ebb and flow and have things like cross-marked pendants and things in them. In Scotland, we have unfurnished graves. It's graves where there's not even evidence for much clothing, uh, uh, just very simple graves. And that takes us from prehistory into the Middle Ages. And so the only way of tracking change over time has been in recent years with much more precise radiocarbon dating and the like. So that allowed me to write a PhD considering what the evidence for burial practice does or doesn't tell us about Christianity. And that's how I came to Whithorn as a critical uh, example of archaeologically excavated, seemingly early Christian burials. Okay, so there's a lot to talk about here, so let's just dive in. The archaeology here at Whithorn is outstanding and really deserves to be better known. So thanks for uh, giving me and uh, the trust this platform. Uh, Whithorn is famous as the cult place of St. Ninian, uh, a kind of a shadowy saint, uh, but with several traditions uh, saying he was either a bishop there in Roman times or in immediately post-Roman times. It's really quite hard to sort of say much uh, uh, that is reliable when you're basing all of your information on saints' lives and later traditions, but there is no doubting that the cult of St. Ninian was massively important. By the 12th century, he becomes one of the national saints, you know, that, that kings of the Scots are sort of coming to, uh, to Whithorn to uh, pay their respects and pray at the altar leave their offerings, you know. Uh, we have copious evidence for dedications to St. Ninian spreading across the country from the 12th century onwards, uh, and other evidence of a vibrant cult. And, and indeed, the St. Ninian's Day pilgrimage is something which continues to this day, not with this sort of scale of, uh, of sort of pomp, uh, as you see in this fantastic photo from 1932, uh, but it certainly does continue on an annual basis even today. Uh, so there's no doubting that the cult there was incredibly important, very well known, and internationally as well. There's been a lot of historical work recently, which has established the fame of St. Ninian and uh, and his, his, uh, his shrine there at Whithorn. Just a couple of examples of material culture here. Uh, um, a lead pilgrim badge, you know, one of many that would have survived, that you would have got when you came to the shrine there. Um, that's kept by the Whithorn Trust. And uh, in the National Museum of Scotland, where I currently work, this incredible survival from the late Middle Ages, showing that, you know, in the 15th and 16th centuries, you know, uh, even as things change, the cult of St. Ninian sort of carries on to a certain extent here. Uh, I like that this wooden statue, though, was deposited in a bog. And so, you know, it doesn't seem to have been burned down or ripped down, you know, the uh, sort of appendages are missing here. But otherwise, it was one of these examples of a uh, um, of, of Christian material culture that was uh, taken down and then deposited, buried, 
rather than sort of destroyed in the other way that you often hear about during the Reformation. Interesting stuff, but I'm not going to be talking about today. Uh, what I'm dealing with today is the very, very earliest layers of evidence that we can peel back uh, through all the great historical and archaeological work that has been devoted to Weidhorn for well over 100 years now. Uh, indeed, the legend making around Whithorn, we can date back to the days of Bede. Okay, so Bede in his ecclesiastical history of the English people, uh, written in the 730s, uh, 720s and 730s, uh, he tells the first recorded story that we have of this shadowy figure, St. Ninian. And he is also quite vague in his story, even though he has a lot of detail about what's going on at Whithorn in 730 or so, he has informants there that he's in regular contact with. The origins of the site are something that are kind of even in his day, in the 730s, shrouded in mystery. So what he says is long before, and what he's talking about is long before St. Columba. So he is positioning Ninian as relative to the other apostle of the Scots or the Picts that you may have heard about. So if you know this famous Saint Columba, who is based on Iona, well, this one is even earlier than that. That's basically what Bede is saying here, uh, long before as the story goes. Doesn't give any kind of dates or anything like that. It's just sort of in the long time ago. There was a bishop and he's recorded as the first bishop, Ninia. Uh, and you can see in one of the earliest surviving manuscript copies of Bede, you can see these words, these names being written down for the first time, uh, at least in the first time that we can uh, uh, recognize today. And he names the site as Candida Casa, the White House. Apparently, the legend goes that this was a stone house covered in mortar around the outside or whitewashed in some way so that it was gleaming white. And this was a marvel in a time and place where there was no stone architecture, certainly no mortared stone buildings. This church of St. Ninian was locally uh, and, and then at this time now becoming nationally famous. And so we should believe, we could believe that there is a, 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 a genuine sort of old building of some sort that was still standing around that time for these stories to sort of uh, 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 carry some kind of weight. Okay, what we do have confirmed, uh, and you can see it for yourself, is this incredible relic. This is the Latinus stone. Now, this was found by William Galloway, who was an architect and an antiquarian, who was busy uh, remodeling and renovating the medieval ruin, uh, which still stands of Whithorn Priory today. Uh, he was uh, consolidating these, basically, and he was carrying out excavations such as they were uh, in the late 19th century. And so, unfortunately, we don't have an exact provenance uh, for where this was found, but we know it was found in the area of the modern graveyard, most likely in the foundations of later medieval walls. So it's at the highest point where the priory uh, of the later Middle Ages and the parish church currently still stand. Okay, so there's a long continuity potentially there at Whithorn. Uh, an incredibly important stone. It used to be thought that it had a Cairo, this sort of uh, Roman uh, or imperial monogram cross at the top, but Kate Forsyth has disproven this. It's just the way some of the uh, stone li uh, fault lines uh, go that kind of catches the light in the wrong way sometimes. So there isn't a cross at the top of this, but there is no doubting that this is a very Christian statement. It begins by naming God, you know, we praise you, the Lord. That's also the beginning of an important prayer. Uh, Latinus, presumably the person who is commissioning the stone, although there's some doubt over that. Uh, Latinus, who is aged 35 and his daughter of five years. I'll pause there because what's interesting about that is that this is a formula of a person and their age uh, uh, that is sort of characteristic of late Roman memorial inscriptions, grave monuments. Uh, uh, in Gaul, you still get these sort of being put up in the fifth uh, and into the sixth centuries. But this sort of, um, it's in line with continuing Roman practice to sort of start your inscription this way, name and age, okay? Uh, I'll carry on then. Uh, Latinus, age 35 and his daughter of five years, here raised this 
signum. There's been considerable debate about that word. I'm a minimalist here, and I'm just uh, I'm happy to accept that that word just means this stone. Okay, but there's been a lot of debate over what that might actually mean. Uh, I'm happy to say that it just means raised this stone. Uh, and then it's signed Nepus Bahroadi, and that could mean that this Latinus is the grandson, or he is of the clan or of the family group, the kin group of the Bahroadi. A lot of interesting things here. Uh, it's been dated by the form of its script to about the middle of the fifth century by Catherine Forsyth. Uh, okay, and, and so that makes it the earliest uh, uh, sort of confirmed evidence for Christianity. But it also tells us that there are people still speaking Latin and literate in Latin uh, after the supposed fall of Rome. So we are in a period in the early to middle of the fifth century where we are increasingly able to recognize that elements of the Roman Empire, the province of Britannia, e uh, uh, continues, or at least some of the customs and ways, uh, even though the coin and coin supply dries up and heavy industry uh, uh, collapses and supply lines fail. Still, people are continuing to speak Latin uh, and, and things like these. People are continuing to be Christians. And we are sort of getting evidence for this here. But wait, you might say, this is well beyond Hadrian's Wall at this point. You're talking about Galloway. Um, but there is plenty of evidence for late Roman activity in Dumfries and Galloway increasingly in the form of coins and coin hordes. Uh, and so even though we are beyond Hadrian's Wall here, we are still within the sort of cultural zone of the continuing Roman Empire. And the work of Rob Collins and, and so many others, uh, Wilmot and others, have established how sort of uh, a, a Roman, a, a Roman militarized province in some fashion does kind of continue uh, in the zone around Hadrian's Wall into the fifth century. And so Whithorn, I think, is unproblematically then part of this sort of zone, even though the evidence for it only begins strictly in the post-Roman period. It just tells you uh, that there are certain things that history does not cover and that can only be unearthed using material culture and archaeology. So it's an incredible survival. There can be no doubt that there were indeed then Christians at Whithorn from around the middle of the fifth century, maybe even uh, speaking and writing in Latin. Okay. Uh, last thing to say about it, though, that this person is the descendant of a Celtic named person or kin group, the Bahruadi. This is a Celtic name. Uh, it wouldn't be out of place anywhere in amongst the Britons or maybe in Ireland. Uh, um, and, and so it is a local family, I suppose, potentially, but that person's name is Latinus. So you can see even name changing practices changing just from one generation to the next captured on this stone. So you could argue that maybe Christianity and Romanized culture is kind of a new introduction, maybe. Uh, here's what we know about it then uh, beyond that. After the 19th century, there was only bits and pieces of work here until finally uh, uh, in the 1980s, the Whithorn Trust was founded in order to support and fund and then take on the display and education around the uh, material culture on Earth. These excavations were led by the late Peter Hill, and he published it in this massive volume, uh, 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 hundreds and hundreds of pages, uh, an incredible piece of work just a few years after the trench was closed for the last time, a monumental task that was achieved basically on a community archaeology shoestring budget. This is just a glimpse of the trench at a certain stage in that excavation. Those lines that you can see in the ground are the remains of a timber minster church of the sort of Northumbrian phase, the 8th century. It is still the oldest confirmed church structure that has been excavated in Scotland. We know that there were churches before this, but this is the first, the earliest one that can be absolutely confirmed uh, through our archaeology, although others have been suggested from the Pictish period that might be contenders. In any case, underneath that early Christian church and uh, the early Christian burials around it, the earliest layers of evidence were ephemeral houses where they're making, there is arable arc, uh, 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 agriculture being practiced, there are plow marks, there are very ephemeral roads, just cobbled paths really, leading up basically through this trench, uh, leading up to the top of the hill where you can see the ruins of the church as they stand from the later medieval period, just off the top left of the image there.
Okay, so these are the earliest structures. And again, you can see a lot of dashed lines here. These are, even these are very notional. They are buried underneath a thousand and more uh, uh, years of occupation. And so this is very truncated archeology, span very difficult to read. And also quite problematically at the time, because of the budget, uh, radiocarbon dates were almost inaccessible. Uh, to the uh, Whithorn Trust excavations, okay? Uh, thankfully, they have a lot of material culture, pottery, coins, and things that they could date the layers through. And so they relied on these datable objects to create a chronology for the site. Based on that, everything that we know about it then, uh, 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 Peter Hill and his team suggested a fifth or sixth century start to this settlement, okay? Uh, certainly by the sixth century is in operation. Uh, what they found and what they're less sort of keen on in the book, because it's actually quite uh, uh, disturbed, there is actually quite a bit of Roman material culture here. And the two examples of ceramic that I show you here are second century uh, types of wares. They come with the sort of Antonine period of occupation, more or less. There are Mortaria coarse wares, like you see at the bottom of the screen, and fine wares like Samian ware, which you get absolutely anywhere where there's Roman occupation at this time. Okay, and you get it in a lot of non non-Roman places in Scotland as well. So this doesn't prove that there is a Roman settlement there. But there's so much of it, and there's so much of it that is coarse wares as well. You know, the kind of stuff that isn't necessarily being traded because it looks nice. Uh, it, 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 it sort of, um, the coarse wares reveal a sort of Roman diet, if you like, uh, as much as high status trade goods. And it's scattered all across the site. And the last Thing. Uh, most of these are, again, second century kind of Antonine era when there's lots of Roman forts in Dumfries and Galloway. And so there's a clear pipeline for these things to be arriving there. But there are things which continue. They're sort of later wares and they're the latest uh, of the Roman finds here was indeed a fourth century coin. Just the one, all in disturbed contexts. And so Peter Hill and his team didn't really put much stock into these. It's kind of loose stuff, stray finds floating about. But there's just so much of it across the site that I, you know, you have to think that there is a substantial pipeline, if not a Roman settlement here, certainly a settlement which has connections to that continuing, that 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 sort of Roman empire, uh, that province of Britannia may be continuing as late as the fourth century. Okay, in the post-Roman period, that's when the archaeology really kicks off. That's when we can begin to date things with associated finds like these imported wares. There are several kinds of imports that make their way to Whithorn. This map is from, uh, and all my information really comes down to the great Ewan Campbell of Glasgow Uni, who has done uh, 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 this, uh, this incredible work highlighting all of the imported finds in early medieval Britain, uh, certainly from the West Coast and Ireland. This is a map of just one of these. These pot sherds that you see on your right there are sherds of African red slipware, which is certainly being made in Carthage. This stuff is bog standard in the Mediterranean uh, from about the third century to about the eighth century. All right, but very rare to find in Britain after the Roman period. And so you can see on the map here, it's going very much from Cornwall up the Irish Sea zone and then sort of being traded uh, on from there. Tintagel remains by far the largest assemblage of these early imports, but Whithorn is a big contender just, uh, 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 just in terms of the uh, amount compared to other big hill forts closer to Tintagel, like Dennis Powis, which I highlight here. It's just to say that Whithorn is continuing to be on a pipeline of trade goods of exotic high, high status material uh, into the sort of fifth and uh, sixth centuries, okay? So that's interesting. That goes along with, I suppose, that culture of the Latina stone. They're in touch with the continuing Roman worlds uh, in Gaul and, and, and places between us and the Mediterranean. Okay, I just want to flag up this horrendous uh, 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 table just to say I've taken a few examples. Tintagel I've mentioned already, major import site in Cornwall, and a couple of other hill forts with Whithorn compared. All of these columns are just different kinds of those exotic imported uh, uh, kinds of pottery. There are Roman amphorae, there are fine wares, there is basically uh, 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 dishes and plates and bowls to big storage containers like amphora containing what must be 
wine and other exotic material from the Mediterranean, from different parts. Okay, all of these things are made in different parts of the Mediterranean, uh, 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 from the from the Eastern Mediterranean to Carthage, uh, and so. All of the, almost all of these different kinds of wares, which we know are coming into Britain, almost all of them are found at Whithorn, even though, again, sometimes in just minimal amounts. But if you compare those amounts with another couple of big hill forts, again, I've just selected two here, you can see that the assemblages from Whithorn, even though they are much further from Tintagel, are comparable to the others. So Tintagel this is the major redistribution hub for the rest of Britain and Ireland, and Whithorn is one of the key recipients. Okay, so there's evidence here of a targeted exchange and kept up for a long period of time. So these are just fifth and sixth century wares, and that does continue into the sixth and seventh century as those imports change. I showed you the Latina stone. The other critical piece of evidence is the Petra stone or the Peter stone. This is a stone that is found here where that blue marker is just on the edge of town. And it seems to be on the main road leading from the Isle of Whithorn, which would appear, as far as we know, to be the closest usable good harbor. So that's where all these imports are coming from. And this is basically on the road. So this is the boundary marker. This is a kind of different date, though. This is dating us to the seventh century now, and it's mentioning mentioning Saint Peter the Apostle uh, with this lovely Cairo cross. Now, the Latina stone didn't have one. This one certainly does, uh, and this is a kind of stone which we know much more about uh, in terms of its parallels. There's lots of stones with Cairo's uh, now from elsewhere in Galloway and uh, uh, from Wales and several other parts of the western. Uh, Irish sea zone, basically. So the Cairo here is indicative, again, of continued contact with Gaul and Byzantium. It's just a sort of uh, signal of cultural affiliation at that point. And it's interesting that it's not even at the core of the site, it's marking the entrance. And no mention of Ninian here, it's also worth saying in the Latina stone or on this stone, instead we talk about uh, Peter the Apostle here. OK, uh, the other thing to say is that this imagery is also found on those very import wares that you're getting. So this is a shirt of a Gaulish ware that is coming into the sixth century from a different uh, place. And we have fragments of these from Whithorn as well. So again, these imports and that cultural zone, the Christianized zone, uh, they're all kind of merged together. So the trade and uh, the culture. Uh, uh, and the religion all are kind of blending together, okay? And it's not to say that Christianity arrives with these pots. It's just part of the culture that they all indicate, okay? So Peter Hill and his team were able to identify a couple of ephemeral timber and wattle structures, and they reconstructed them into various kinds of shrines. And in sort of reassessing these things, myself and other people who have kind of reconsidered these excavations have been less and less confident about these early timber shrines and timber structures. They're all quite ephemeral. And if they were shrines, they seem to have been eaten into by graves almost immediately after being put up. And so it's kind of difficult to believe that these were really holy sort of sacred enclosures if they are completely disturbed immediately after their building. And so it's hard to know what these things all are. These are just sort of some of the things that they sort of suggested. Uh, in the place of those early structures, this entire cemetery kind of disturbs all the earlier archaeology. And so the other thing to say is that this cemetery is really difficult to peel apart. Uh, they put uh, they put together something like 17 different sub phases for the cemetery, saying these are the earliest, and then those, and then those, and then those, up to 17 different sub stages. And I think that's uh, going way further than, frankly, the, the archaeology can really sort of support, especially in the absence of radiocarbon dates. So in my PhD, I kind of tried to peel these layers apart into sort of simpler, a simpler phasing. Uh, I, I, I grant you that this is not the kind of thing that you would call simple. I'm working on better visualizations for these with a proper illustrator now, okay? But this is just to show you uh, that the, it, it's easier to sort of say that there is a three layer uh, uh, layout to this graveyard. The earliest graves are picked out in orange. They're not quite in rows at that point. They're quite scattered, but they're all roughly in the same orientation. These are cut into by those red graves, 
which are now in a different orientation. And they're very clearly shoulder to shoulder. It looks like a managed cemetery at that point. Okay, so you have a quite scattered, idiosyncratic early cemetery, and then a more organized cemetery. I feel like that red phase, I postulated in my PhD, that red phase of burial, that signifies the uh, um, what we can clearly say is probably the origins of the monastery in terms of sort of centralized management of burial. So, and underneath all of those phases is those red and blue blobs, and that's the import wares. So there's a huge scatter of ceramic and glass. So they are really sort of living it up at this site. And these layers with bear, with uh, uh, wine, amphorae, and glass vessels to drink out of it, that's the kind of barrier, that's the layers that those earliest burials are cutting into. So I think underneath these three layers, there is a layer of settlement which does not relate to that early monastery. And so that was my theory that there is a settlement here and then there was burial after and only after a certain phase do this, does it become what we can clearly see a monastery, okay? So that was all kind of hypothetical, basically. Uh, uh, and then in 2015 and 18, I was able to work with the Whithorn Trust on the project I'll tell you about for the remainder of this lecture. Last thing I wanna say here though, is that uh, the Northumbrian Minster Church the timber church and stone-footed clay-built church that you can see at the top of the trench there was built over this burial ground. So burial is happening here for at least a century or more, and then all of that is overlain by another reorganization of the site. And in this phase, very clearly, a timber and stone church. That stone chapel that you see on the uh, on the right hand side there certainly has burials within and outside of it. So it's a burial chapel, and the timber church then is a timber minster church. But it continues to have these royal halls, which look for all the world like feasting halls. You know, so there is royal and high status ecclesiastical settlement here from the. 8th and 9th century. And that was called a Northumbrian phase. It's called a Northumbrian takeover. As you've seen from Ken's paper this morning, uh, these churches are on an axial arrangement. They are on the same line. And you see that kind of layout repeated in Anglo-Saxon monasteries, yeah, from Kent to Northumbria. And so this is uh, based along those lines. So we're very much into the world of the sort of uh, 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 the 8th and 9th centuries here, even if we didn't have any other dating evidence to go with it. Okay, a reconstruction drawing of how this may have looked uh, with the halls uh, underneath the sort of uh, the timber minster. Okay, so that's how the site ends up looking around the time that Bede is writing about Ninian for the first time. This is the monastery that Bede is describing. Okay. So in 20, uh, 2018, as I mentioned, I was lucky enough to partner with the Whithorn Trust. Julia Muir Watt is the development manager there. She was able to get funding from a variety of sources, mainly the Esme Fairbairn Collections Fund. And we started what was called the Cold Case Whithorn. In the spirit of the Whithorn Trust, it would be a community facing project. We would make a lot of videos and all of that material is available still on social media. We sort of had videos recording the progress of everything that we were doing as we went along long and it's finally i hope finally coming to publication now in 2023 uh this has never been the sort of full-time job it's always been pro bono on my part but i'm so happy to be involved with this amazing group of people and the cold case cold case whithorn project just continues to grow and uh and 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 train people up it's been an incredible uh shot in the arm for the whithorn trust which has managed the museum based on the whithorn excavations ever since the 1980s, an incredible organization. Uh, so uh, based on the back of that, what we've been mainly doing is finally undertaking radiocarbon dating of charcoal, of organic material, but more importantly, the human remains. So what I'm showing you here, the radiocarbon dates from non-human remains. This is from MIN material. It shows you the date that the settlement was in operation, basically. And try as we might, there is nothing that we've dated so far that takes us back any earlier than the fifth century. You can see the little ticker here on the x-axis. These are calendar years AD. 
400 to 500, that's when the probability distributions begin. And just as a little, uh, just as a little reminder, just put these little red lines to say the rough date of the Latina stone, the middle of the fifth century, and the rough date for the Peter stone uh, around the year 600. Okay. And what we see from the radiocarbon dates is that the settlement is certainly in operation from the fifth century. We've proven that as if that needed to be proven. It's just good to get an empirical basis uh, for this based on numerous radiocarbon dates. And it's a continuous sequence, basically. There is a jump there from 600 to 700. But again, at that point, we're radiocarbon dating human remains more than anything else, of which more anon. Basically, there's a seamless uh, sequence, basically, uh, from the fifth century, but no earlier, it seems, at least so far. Okay, that's an important thing. The earliest graves, and this is perhaps surprising, uh, is uh, the, the earliest date for human bone that we've achieved so far is only as early as the seventh century. There's a lot of caveats that we can go into here, but the human remains survive better at one end of the site than the other. And basically, we have not been able to see uh, anything earlier than the seventh century in terms of burials so far. So uh, this is just some of the evidence here, mostly male, but again, problematic because the skeletal evidence was quite fragmentary. Okay, certainly all adults, as far as we can tell, buried in a variety of ways, from kists to coffins to log coffins. Okay, but all roughly dating to a nice, tidy 600 to 670, 680 kind of time period for the most part for these earliest graves. I'll show you on a map uh, where these are. These are the orange ones that we were able to date. Uh, again, human bone is not forthcoming from all of them. Several samples failed. Those are the ones that are in black there, but it's good to be transparent when you're doing science, you know. Um, these orange ones are the ones that I proposed are the earliest phase, just based on which grave cuts which grave. And I was happy to find that they are indeed still the earliest graves, although there is one that is radiocarbon dated from this later row that does belong to that early phase. It shows you that the transition between these phases is probably quite sudden in sort of radiocarbon years, okay? There's men and women among those radiocarbon data, but again, those, uh, those assignations are still quite tentative and in a variety of different coffins. Okay, so even those earliest graves uh, that are cutting into that layer of uh, import wares and midden material are only from the seventh century so far. And as you can see, on the bottom right, there's a lot of graves that just did not have enough human remains. Uh, and so it is possible that there are early burials in this corner here, but we have not been able to verify them yet. OK, just uh, just some more detail there. Uh, this is an example of a log coffin. This is one of the earliest uh, ones that we were dated, a replica of. This is an incredible uh, 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 and, and quite rare, we thought, kind of burial. But then there's, uh, there's more examples that I've written up now from Scotland. Uh, and so it's more common than we thought, but it's very indicative of the fifth and sixth centuries, OK? And at least one of the early burials in, the, in this form of sort of indigenous style, undecorated as far as we can tell, uh, rough hewn, hollowed out tree trunks. OK, uh, which is really interesting. And we find that that kind of burial, which is, again, indigenous to this area, we have fifth and sixth century examples from other sites in the Lothians. So we can see that the log coffin is a sort of uh, burial practice that is practiced by the Britons uh, by this time. It is taken up in a big, in a big manner uh, in the so-called Northumbrian phase, where most of them are in log coffins. And there's been other uh, Middle Saxon, uh, that is 8th, 9th century uh, cemeteries that have been excavated since then, and Great Ribera which is almost completely dominated by the log coffin burial form. And so there is something about Middle Saxon monasteries and the log coffin rite that might be connected. Well, we're certainly seeing that here, OK? But we have evidence that they predate the Northumbrian phase here as well. It's important to say, OK, men and women. Uh, that should probably be no surprise as well. Uh, we think the monasteries are only populated uh, by men or women, but we have lots of examples now from excavated monasteries from Jarrow to Port Mahomic, that there are men and women in these communities. They don't all necessarily 
have to be the religious brethren in every case in the cemeteries that we have fortuitously been able to excavate and date. Okay, so uh, look at the radiocarbon dates. They really strongly overlap with those early graves, which again supports the notion that that phase from early scattered graves to row graves shoulder to shoulder happens pretty quickly. But it happens in the late 7th century at the earliest. And so, again, it's hard to say with radiocarbon dates, but uh, if you're talking about the 670s to 700, this is a few generations before Bede is writing, potentially, that this becomes a monastery. Okay, So this predates, potentially, what we know about the Northumbrian takeover of this area. That's important as well. It becomes a monastery, potentially, before the Northumbrian takeover. Okay, and then here they are. Here's where these were from. I won't go into any more detail there as we have to kind of uh, run through. Uh, we also dated, and that's what this little, uh, this little inset is pulled out here. That's the Northumbrian burial chapel that is superimposed on these graves. Uh, uh, again, orientation changes. These are now indoor burials. We've radiocarbon dated those, and they overlap significantly with these early log coffin burials. And again, what it's telling you is that this is a site which is in heavy use. There's not sort of gaps of occupation as the site changes. It changes along with the fashions at the time, and it changes rapidly. You know, these burials are sort of being superimposed one on the other through basically a continuous and intense uh, uh, period of settlement here, okay? Um, let's move on then. Uh, we've got a lot of science that's coming uh, uh, to publication. Again, as I said this year, this is led by our partners in the University of Bradford, partner in crime, Shirley Curtis Summers, incredible bioarchaeologist, and her team have been doing stable isotope analysis. More on that later on this year, but I'll just sort of give a preview that Shirley has done sort of Zoom lectures about. This is just a screenshot of one of those, uh, just for ease of use. It uh, acknowledges Shirley's work here rather than my own. But what they've established is that, that there are locals and non-locals, but most of those non-locals are coming from elsewhere in southern Scotland. You know, so people are coming to Galloway amongst those buried here, but very few are coming from other parts of Northumberland or uh, the sort of Eastern Anglo-Saxon parts, you know, so it's not this mass movement of people that is creating these changes. There are some like SK716 who are outliers according to diet and isotope. So there are people that seem to be coming from parts East, but they are very few compared to the uh, the a majority of people who are local or at least from southern Scotland. Okay, so redating so far, proven early dates uh, coincident with that uh, evidence from early inscribed stones. The settlement is certainly in operation by the time those stones are put up. Okay, but burial, as far as we can tell, begins only here in the seventh century. Okay, so there is a phase before burial begins. Problem again, we haven't had access to. Uh, all the uh, burials because bone does not survive very, very well in certain parts of the site. Uh, but also the Northumbrian phase now seems to, uh, uh, the sort of monastic phase, I should say, begins before the historically documented Northumbrian takeover of the area. So what does it all mean then? Let's zoom out a little bit now. Okay, those Latin inscribed stones that I mentioned here at Whithorn have been mapped out by Catherine Forsyth. Okay, and so you can see that Whithorn has these two, but there are several more in the peninsula called the Rins of Galloway. Okay, so uh, uh, there's uh, there's a cluster basically belonging to this region. It just shows you that Whithorn is not the only game in town. There are other places. There's a functioning Christian uh, hierarchy uh, 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 here. Okay, so that's really important. And it ties in with a, a sort of network of sites across uh, the Northern Irish Sea Zone. Across the way in Northern Ireland, there's a few early Cairo and inscribed stones on the Isle of Man. There's Ogham stones and other continuing Roman stones in parts east. Okay, so Whithorn is part of a wider cultural zone. It's not the only game in town. Uh, once again. What I find really interesting about this is that, again, while the late Roman material is not really forthcoming at Whithorn itself, Fraser Hunter has documented all of the finds of late Roman coins, that is, coins that have come to Scotland 
after the Roman armies have officially pulled back to Hadrian's Wall. There are no longer occupied forts in Scotland, but coins and other material culture continues to find its way north, either as payments for mercenaries or clients or veterans of the Roman army who have moved back home. Whatever the reason may be, coins, ceramic, other things are still coming north of Hadrian's Wall. And the coins, those dots that you can see on the map there, are clustering in southern Scotland and heavily in the Rins and Mackers area as well. There's big, huge hordes from the sort of loose sands area. And, and, and so again, this place is in contact with the wider world before the Latinus stone is put up. And so my model of how Christianity comes to this area isn't so much based around these legendary missionaries as much as continued contact and constant contact communication with the rest of the Roman world as it was in the fifth and sixth centuries. Uh, what I called in the thesis, a low drama conversion rather than sort of missionaries you know, waving the flag or the crook, as it were, and just kind of forcing everybody to do as they say, something a little bit more from the ground up. Okay, these are these other stones. They date from the sixth century now. They're later than the Latinus stone. In fact, they're quite neatly in between the Latinus and the Peter stone. And they have this Cairo monogram and they name people with Celtic and Latin names. There is a Florentius on one of those stones, but there's also a Viventius and a Maborius. So some of these are Celtic. They could be Gaulish, but they could just be anywhere that there's Celtic speakers. And there's biblical verse, you know. So these are literate people, they are reading the Bible, they're quoting from the Bible. So whoever's reading these is sort of uh, uh, knows what they're looking at when they see initium et finis, the beginning and the end. Okay, they know what that means, the alpha and the omega. Uh, uh, and so this is, again, a cultural province uh, where Christianity is uh, 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 sort of vibrant and in operation. Okay, and just to stress that there are examples of each of these across the water in what's now Northern Ireland as well. There's an, an, an incredible, lovely, uninscribed, that is, there's no name uh, written on it, just a Cairo on a standing stone from County Antrim. Uh, and that is uh, uh, very interestingly, it is also the same even the same uh, circumference of the Cairo inscribed on those at Kirk Madrine, you know, so they're related. Um, and there's also another stone dating now to the seventh or eighth century that also names the locus of Peter the Apostle. So whatever's going on at Whithorn seems to be going on across the Irish Sea, across the North Channel at the same time. Okay, so these places are all networked, they're connected, that's important to say. And these are the churches and the ones marked in red are the ones we know where there are bishops resident uh, in this kind of zone around the 7th and 8th century. And just to go back to what we were talking about before, this is a map from Ewan Campbell's work of Eware. This is pottery now that is coming from Gaul, from, from France, uh, um, from modern day France that is still continuing to be imported. And it is coming to basically these same areas. Uh, a big dot there at Whithorn, lots of dots across the water where there is also a proliferation of churches that we know are in operation, Bangor, Mavilla, Nandrum, down, uh, all the places associated with St. Patrick uh, in that area, okay? So the, 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 the cultural province and the trade province overlap here, okay? Let's get back down to then where we started. What do we know now after all of that about St. Ninian? A lot of historical work has sort of gone on here. We're still no clearer uh, about the sort of origins, but Thomas Clancy in a very influential article has argued that Ninian might be just a later corruption, could even just be a typo that was sort of uh, uh, enshrined when it was written down, you know? Uh, a corruption for an earlier historically attested saint, a church father called Winniaw. Uh, in Ireland becomes known as Finian. He's associated most strongly with Movilla. Uh, but uh, we know he was correspondent with Gildas. He may have been the teacher of Columba himself. Uh, there's a lot of people called Finian, but it seems to be that this is uh, a very famous one, very likely to have a big cult around him. Uh, and we know he's working, again, just across the water. Um, there, 
at uh, at Movilla. Okay, so that might be the person behind that cult. So it might not be that there was an actual person called Ninian, but that this legend grows around this uh, sort of name that was well known in the area, which might have been Winiao. So that's a possibility. Uh, it doesn't mean that the later the cult was any less real, but it is fascinating that we have the opportunity to see how these cults are built up in the early Christian period, okay? Layering of sanctity, that, if that is Winia, we know that there are Christians at least a century before him at Whithorn, okay? But we see that elsewhere. The Isle of May, another monastery, has burials dated to the 5th and 6th century, but the dedication is from a saint who lived uh, at least a century later than uh, uh, than the, the sort of archaeology tells us that settlement begins. At Port Mahomic in the far north, burial and settlement from the 6th century, but the dedication is to a much later saint, and over and over again. And so we have this idea that early Christian sites are not always churches to begin with. They could just be burial and settlement with Christians, but not an explicitly ecclesiastical site. And then they get appropriated and then they become uh, power centers in a Christian manner. Uh, but they accrue those layers of sanctity. They accrue those saints with them. Uh, and indeed, in, in Northumbria, uh, elsewhere, Aldham and Lindisfarne, uh, two uh, very famous examples that we know uh, are predate the cults of the saints that they were most associated with. Okay, so what's going on here? Uh, Bede uh, is, is famously kind of cross with the Britons. They didn't evangelize the Anglo-Saxons hard enough, and so he kind of demonizes them in their work. And so part of this is, uh, is, is attributed that maybe, maybe Bede and the Northumbrians were sort of clashing with the Britons at this point, and we know that there's lots of battles between them, and so maybe he's just towing the sort of party line by kind of doing down the Britons and bigging up the Northumbrians. But actually, Gildas, a Briton working uh, two centuries before him, uh, uh, who he's heavily reliant on, is also kind of down on the other Britons, okay? So in his work, uh, he has lots of salty things to say about other other British Christians, okay? They remain in the same old unhappy slime of intolerable sin, okay? And they obtain the priestly seat of bishop, but they never sit in it. They just wallow there disgracefully like pigs. What he's saying is that people in his time are buying into titles like bishop and deacon, but they're not really sort of uh, true bishops uh, in his eyes. They are just uh, taking the title for status reasons and then using that title to acquire things like wine uh, and uh, property and, uh, again, uh, status. And so that is something that goes well back to before uh, uh, Bede. It just seems like in these early centuries, what was called Christianity isn't something that everybody is agreeing on. And there are the right Christians and the wrong Christians, even if they don't go as far as calling them heretics in every case. Okay. Uh, and so in these ages, uh, even what they at the time would recognize as Christian is up for grabs. And so how are we a thousand or more years later to decide what is uh, uh, really Christian? You know, it's it was problematic for them then, and it's going to be problematic for us now. We just have to keep that in mind. Indeed, uh, sites like hill forts, which are power centers, the seats of kings, uh, are receiving these imports of wine, just like Whithorn is. Uh, and some of these may be Christian establishments without any Christian inscribed stones, okay? So St. Patrick famously writes an open letter to Caroticus, the king of Dumbarton Rock, which does have imported wine amphora, just like Whithorn. He says that they're Christians, but they're bad Christians. Okay, uh, he's admonishing them for taking slaves of Christians. And so again, even where we have evidence of that Christian cultural zone, it doesn't mean that it's something that everybody would have agreed on that they were good or the right kind of Christians. So that's important to mention as well. And now uh, with other excavations for the north in Aberdeenshire, we have evidence of sites that are well beyond this sort of Christianized late Roman, late antique zone, which are also in receipt of these wine amphora and glass vessels. This is Rhiney, a site, uh, a, a royal site of the Picts, which has been argued to me maybe a cult hall, a pagan pre-Christian cult hall, but is also 
in receipt of these same kinds of imports. So again, these things, uh, are archaeology, uh, much more archaeology is needed to sort of really contextualize these things. Uh, what I think we're seeing at Whithorn then is a, a kind of site that didn't really exist about 20 years ago. It's something like the in Ireland they call cemetery settlements. There are burial grounds with lots of evidence for craft working and yes, the importation of wine amphorae and e-ware uh, from the continent. So they're again within that cultural uh, Christian zone, but they are not themselves church sites. They are gathering places, they're assembly sites, they're places of elite uh, consumption, but also production and manufacture of gold, silver, uh, uh, and bronze dress items and things like these. These are elite burial grounds, but not themselves churches, even though this is certainly a Christian time period. I think we're seeing something very similar to that, which hasn't existed in, in, in Scotland yet, uh, but across the water. Uh, another thing to point out, is that Whithorn doesn't just have wine and, and, and other vessels, which you could argue are part of the mass ritual. They also have really showy glass vessels. And these glass vessels are indicative of drinking culture, of feasting culture. And you find them in Anglo-Saxon graves and you find them in Hillfords and you're finding them in great numbers at Whithorn. These are the kinds of vessels that you can't sort of put down. You have to down the liquid and the <laughs> before you put it down. Okay, so this is elite feasting culture. And I'll just show you another terrible graph uh, here from uh, a table from, from uh, Ewan Campbell's work. In terms of glass only, Whithorn has more glass vessels even than Tintagel so far, even than Dennis Powis or any of these other hill forts. Whithorn has more glass than all of these sites. So if these are feasting culture, they are feasting harder at Whithorn than anywhere else, despite the fact that, again, we know that there are Christians knocking about from the 5th and 6th centuries there. Uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily need to be a monastery. Uh, there's also really rare bits of glass that are only coming from Anglo-Saxon graves and in a couple of sites. These are the only examples of claw beakers outside of graves in the West, Dennis Powers, Whithorn, and one in Ireland. Okay, and the same with this kind of beaker. So really exotic, high status, rare stuff is coming to Whithorn. So what does it all add up to? One thing that I'm building up towards is that this is, Whithorn is a power center, a place of feasting and grand assemblies, uh, almost certainly populated by Christians, but maybe not exclusively. Uh, another possibility is that there is a bishop here, but it is one of those bishops that Gildas would have looked down on who had the title, but not the sort of lifestyle. Another possibility, which I really like, comes from a recent article by Alex Wolf. He's talking about with other parallels on the other sides of the Roman frontier in Syria and in Egypt, uh, uh, that there are, uh, there are people who are called duches and reguli, these are petty kings in translation, who don't necessarily have to be Christian, but do adopt Christianity because they are working closely with the Roman Empire. They are supplying them with mercenaries and goods, and they're being rewarded even though they're outside the Roman Empire with high status luxury goods. They're being paid in coins or gold and silver, and they are becoming sort of Romanized uh, through this kind of diffusion of high status goods. They may even, again, convert to Christianity uh, to kind of maintain those networks. The problem is, in most places, when the Roman Empire collapses, those reguli also kind of fade away. Maybe what's happening in Galloway is something like this. A petty kingdom is sort of bigging itself up, using Christianity and those imports as a way to sort of firm up uh, royal status. And this is one of their main centers here at Whithorn. And again, converting to Christianity potentially already by this point, but not necessarily a monastery as we would see it. That seems to, as far as we can tell, date from the end of the seventh century. So this shows us again how these cult places build up slowly, gradually, and it's not conversion is not this one uh, uh, massive turn that changes everything. Uh, 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 you know, it's not transmitted and accepted right away. These are things that have to build up. And crucially, I think they have to build up through local acclaim as much as anything else, not just imposed from the outside, but sort of from the ground up in ways that sort of benefit and are agreeable or translatable to the way that local power uh, works.
Uh, I think I'll just leave it there. Okay, folks. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks very much for that, uh, Dr. Adrian. Uh, that was really, really interesting. And uh, there's so much you've said um, that that is worth thinking about again. Uh, please, if you have questions, post them in the chat. Uh, I have lots, but I'll just ask one. Is there, is there any archaeological evidence of uh, the development of, of the cult there, you know, in, in terms of a shrine or anything like that? Uh, what, 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 was there a shrine in the medieval church? Is there any evidence? Or, I mean, I noticed that there was uh, a putative shrine feature in some of the maps. You know, um, yes. I'm, I'm aware from I'm aware from my own contact with the Eastern Church. You know, most of the local saints are just from local acclaim. You know, uh, and and even where Bede writes about uh, the Augustinian mission coming across some Christians who venerated a uh, Saint Sixtus. You know. Um, I, I'm just wondering whether it was possible that he wasn't necessarily, Ninian perhaps existed, wasn't necessarily a bad bishop, he was just a local, a very local bishop, you know, and, and he was just a name that people remembered locally, but later on developed into a much more universal figure. Is there evidence for anything of that, or is the cult, archaeologically speaking, very much later? I think, uh, well, I mean, the, the, the archaeology of cults really depends on pilgrim badges and yep. the actual architecture of a shrine. Uh, yep. What we have in the Timberminster church is chancel screens and divisions within that church, which show you that it's actually a really complex architecturally laid out thing. And the altar is in close to the center of that church as well. And so it's a really complicated arrangement with lots of internal divisions. That suggests to me a very important and quite elaborate, uh, probably a tomb shrine of a kind that doesn't really sort of survive. It means that there are relics venerated there. And so certainly from that point on, the sort of other shrines that are postulated uh, in, in Peter Hill's drawings, I think they kind of go out of use too quickly. They seem too ephemeral for me to be venerated as shrines. They build up with mid material almost immediately after they're being built, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so I don't think those outdoor shrines are necessarily the ones there. The big open question is what's going on at the top of the hill? So where the priory is now and the parish church is now is at the highest point. And these churches seem to be kind of on the edge of the brow of that hill. And nobody's actually dug inside the nave of that church. They've dug in the east end. And the archaeology there only takes us back to the 11th century at the earliest. But the nave of the hill is still a working burial ground. It's almost impossible, I think, to, to, to ever dig there. Uh, but there's possibly an earlier shrine maybe that stone church is uh, uh is maybe still up uh, uh up there somewhere and so maybe we're only seeing the sort of fringe the run-up to that settlement uh rather than the core of the settlement itself and that brings us to the next question which is uh wow thank you yes indeed uh since there is settlement in the fifth and sixth centuries where are the bodies do we have any evidence for an early cemetery earlier cemetery in the Whitton area that would be contemporary and, and I'll add to that you know that's right it, do you do you do you feel you've exhausted the settlement or or have you hardly touched the settlement uh, it, yeah, whereas a, a, a couple of things, I don't want to leave, uh, I don't want to leave the, the sort of notion of a bad bishop necessarily <laughs> hanging too hard in the air there. If Winiao is uh, a, a real figure behind that name Ninian, certainly Winiao is one of the church fathers. It's uh, mm -hmm. people that Gildas and, 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 uh, and people of his time are really depending on. They're creating penitentials, they're creating the monastic way of life in Britain. So if this is the real person, there is no doubt that this is a, a very famous and well-respected scholar. Uh, 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 so, uh, so whatever whatever is behind that name uh, is probably uh, uh, probably not a bad bishop in any yeah. case. Uh, it doesn't, uh, but it doesn't mean that it's there at Whithorn. Whithorn no, doesn't no. have to be the center of that uh, cult. That's no. all I'm arguing. Uh, so this is a power center, while maybe the monastery is somewhere else in the vicinity. Uh, but in terms of other burials, there's been very few early medieval burials of any kind excavated in Dumfries and Galloway so far. There's a lack of excavation generally, and certainly specifically around church settlements. And so there's very few long kiss cemeteries or any early medieval cemeteries whatsoever. Uh, and so basically, it needs a lot more work. So there's not so uh, 
So we don't actually know where the you, dead you are buried yeah, that's anyway. That's right, that's right. Even, even 500 years before Ninian, you, presently we don't know where anyone was, you know? Uh, there's a couple of Iron Age and Roman Iron Age burials, but I mean, they're few and far between. Uh, and even Viking burials, there's a handful, you know? So at that yeah. point, uh, we really don't have a, a strong archaeology of the church, and it really needs a program of targeted excavation. Yes. Fantastic. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm just going to pause that recording.